It's Thursday, it's 10.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today, Conservative MP Damien Collins, Labour MP Lloyd Russell Moyle, The Telegraph Zoe Strimple and Sebastian Payne of The Financial Times. Today... The Royals spend 15 million more, but are they worth it? We've got this kind of wild west of materials, wild west of teaching, some of which I think is very damaging to children, it's sexualising children inappropriately. Concern from MPs about sex education in schools. Now, what our map does show you very clearly is the red wall. We talk a lot about red walls and blue walls. Do they really mean anything? In 1989, Russia's Berlin Wall came down. In 2019, Labour's Red Wall came down. But Labour's Red Wall is analogous to the Berlin Wall of a totalitarian state. She was at the Glyndebourne Music Festival, sipping champagne, listening to opera. Champagne socialism is back in the Labour Party. But there's nothing wrong with going to the opera, says Labour's deputy leader. More of that later on in the programme. Let's start with the headline in the Daily Mirror. Cost of palace living crisis. It says £100 million for the royals. Rain it in. Yes, we've had uh, the figures for the annual spend of the royal household, known as the Sovereign Grant. It's detailed in a report. And spending has risen by £15 million, or 17%. Uh, no more from the taxpayer. It's come from the reserves. But are they worth it, Damien? I think the royal family are worth it. I think they've demonstrated this year and for many years they're worth a huge amount to this country. Any alternative to the monarchy would have costs attached. And, of course, the Crown Estate makes a net contribution. The royal income for the household is only a small percentage, relatively, of the total amount generated from the Crown Estate. Of course, the Mirror is making the comparison in the cost of living crisis. These were mainly renovations to the palace. The spend has gone up. Uh, Lloyd, do you think they're worth it? Well, I think if we can find ways to garner greater revenue from the use of some of the palaces. I mean, the Queen is rarely at Buckingham Palace now. Quite understandably, she spent a lot of the last few years um, at Windsor. So can we garner more revenues from Buckingham Palace? Can we use that to entertain people more? Can we get those revenues? That, I think, is the question that needs to be asked. I think there's nothing wrong with, um, with necessarily having a head of state, whether they're royals or not. They will cost. But I do think we need to be looking, everyone needs to be looking at efficiencies. You can't be having the head of state increasing things by huge amounts and ordinary working people having to make huge cuts in their, in their personal income. Damien? Well, of course, we want the, the Crown Estate, the Royal Household, to be run efficiently. I don't think anyone's suggesting that it's not. But as you rightly said, a lot of these old buildings, big estates, they require a lot of maintenance and upkeep. Those costs are, those costs are fixed. And a lot of the entertaining that's done at the palace is done you know, in a, an official capacity for you know, state banquets and official dinners and diplomatic receptions and those sorts of things. Zoe, what do you think? Oh, I mean, I think we, well... I say we all know they're, of course, completely worth it. Um, I suppose that you can boil it down to something quite simple, which is we want a royal family, so we have to pay to keep them, and they have to be paid to ke be kept, not in you know, dilapidated, decrepit style. I think what, what perhaps rubs me slightly um, up the wrong way is more hypocrisy. So I don't think there's any hypocrisy in, in, in renovating the palace or allowing the Queen to have her train, but I do think when Charles does kind of put himself in the middle of these sort of green debates and then is found to take helicopters... Um, and private planes to avoid traffic, um, that starts to be like, mm, is that the best use of money? But overall, of course. And it's actually, when you think about the inefficiencies of the rest of taxpayer money in public services, police, the NHS, et cetera, et cetera, the, the sort of spend on, on the royals starts to seem, you know, not quite as, as, as sort of bad. Another raw story in the papers, um, Seb, uh, which is this on the front of the Daily Express. Inside a startling admission on donations, that was then, this is now, Charles would never take suitcase of cash again. What do you make of it? I mean, there's a very 
um, ec um, sort of thin line equilibrium between the public and how they feel about the royal family. And I think Zoe's just seized on that well, that people will accept the royal family and, and being paid quite a lot of money as long as they maintain their constitutional role. This kind of thing you see on the Express is really beneath the future king. And I think he should not have accepted this money. And the idea you've got some guy, the image of a suit full of case walking up the mile, plonking it down in front of Buckingham Palace. It's not exactly the sort of thing that should have ever happened. And the idea they're saying he wouldn't do it in the future, that doesn't really answer the question, why did he do it in the first place? And there's huge questions about Prince Charles's charitable foundations, where they've gone. Some of his closest aides mm -hmm. are now under severe scrutiny for where they've got money from. And I think there needs to be a lot more transparency about what they're doing and why they're raising this money and where it's going. OK, no evidence of illegality. Money went to charity, but you were nodding away there, Damien. No, I think that's right. I, I think they, they have to be very careful about who, who they receive money from, the traceability of that money, what it's used for. No one's suggesting mm. the royal family are benefiting personally out of this, but what we don't want is inappropriate people benefiting from that association with the royal family. All right, well, let's talk about a Westminster Hall debate that is happening today. Uh, it's with a cross-party group of MPs who have some concerns about the teaching of sex and relationship education in schools. I spoke to one of them, Conservative MP, Miriam Cates earlier today. Well, this new relationship and sex education framework was introduced two years ago. Uh, so there's now this statutory duty on secondary schools to teach RSE. Uh, and I think parents want children to be taught the facts about sex and puberty and about the law and kindness and tolerance and acceptance. But I think the problem is this new framework has kind of opened the floodgates to a whole host of external organisations who are producing materials, some of which are fine, but some of which are very much age inappropriate, some are quite extreme in the kind of uh, sex that they talk about, some are quite contested and some are quite political. And I think schools and parents feel quite powerless uh, to, to choose which, which resources are suitable. Uh, and so the problem is that we've got this kind of wild west of materials, wild west of teaching, some of which I think is very damaging to children, it's sexualizing children inappropriately. Uh, and so really I'm calling on the government, it is RSE today, RSE day today, calling on the government to produce stronger guidance, to think much more carefully about what's developmentally appropriate uh, for children and to really crack down on some of these external organizations. What sort of examples can you give our viewers when you talk about things that are age inappropriate, extreme, I presume you mean politically, um, and sexualising youngsters at too young an age? Um, unfortunately, Joe, I can't actually tell you about them because of your broadcast rules. Um, you know, they are not suitable. Uh, to be read out uh, on your programme. And I think that's really? the problem because they are given to young children. And some of them, which I will describe in the debate, because obviously our rules in, in Parliament are different, um, describe quite extreme sexual acts and, and adult uh, sexual concerns to really quite young children. And yes, some of them are extreme politically, but uh, they're also extreme sexually. And I think we have to question the wisdom of sexualising quite young children and moving away from uh, the facts and the basics of, of sex and reproduction. I used to be a biology teacher. I've done my fair share of sex education. It, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's also something that we need to be very, very careful about. And my concern at the moment is that there are some organisations that most parents would not be comfortable with teaching about sex and relationships to their children uh, that are coming into school, that are, are providing materials that are just not suitable. Right, but Miriam, wouldn't you say that many parents and children themselves would rather know about these things before they perhaps make a mistake or they can understand the world a little bit better if they are taught at a younger age about them. It'll make them, in the end, safer. Well, I absolutely agree. Children should be taught about these things when they're ready to know about them and in a factual and uh, simple way that's appropriate for their development, of course. No, I absolutely, as I said, it's, it's right to teach sex education education in school uh, to teach children about puberty um, but for, I'll, I'll give you an example it's of course it's important to teach children about consent and I think in the light of what was revealed in the everything's invited scandal it's you know of course it's important to teach about consent but if we teach about consent in the way that the only thing that matters is consent and don't mention the fact that children under 16 can't legally consent to sex then we have problems if we're telling children the only thing that matters is consent then that in itself is a is inappropriate it's dangerous and it leads children into into risky behaviors miriam kate's conservative mp lloyd listening to that do you share the concerns of miriam not really actually i don't think she's really explained what the actual substantive concerns 
are. I, I mean, well, what, I don't what know age any... is appropriate, do you think, to learn about things like consent, pornography, non-reproductive well, sex? The, the wider concept of consent, the wider concept that you agree to do something or you don't agree to do something, not just in sex, but in, in everything, should be something that we're teaching children from an extremely early age, before primary school even. The idea that, that you can give consent to things and you can't give consent to things, and at different ages you'll be able to consent to different kinds of things, is something that should be from very early on. And if we don't teach it from very early on, we're opening up our children to abuse. We're opening up our children to be told by people who do not have the best interests of children at heart, don't worry, keep this secret, keep this quiet, it's OK, it's our little secret. So, of course, it needs to be age appropriate. Of course, I wouldn't be saying consent in the bedroom while you're in the action is X, Y, and Z. That would be inappropriate for small children. But the concepts, the broader concepts are. Now, I don't know any school that is teaching that consent is the only thing that matters and nothing thing matters uh, whatsoever apart from that. And if there is a school that's teaching that, that is a problem. But we called for the government to issue guidelines from the very early on. Mm. The government's guidelines were late in this process. Right. And we've got into a real... I do agree that we've got into a muddle. But it should be guidelines that local teachers can then interpret. If you're in a secondary school and you have an outbreak of, say, um, a, a, a sexual disease or you have a, a child, um, a, a, a young person having a, a child parent, yes, you know, course. kind of... Which does happen at secondary schools. You would need to address that with the cohort differently to if you were at, a, right. at a secondary school right. or and a I'll, school I'll where pick, that isn't happening. So you the... need to be reflective to the, to the needs of the local children as well. But on the broad concept, uh, Zoe, what do you make of what you've heard from Lord? I can, I, oh, from, uh, from Lord, I was going to say, I really agree with, with the MP. Um, I mean, I think no. I think I think consent is you know, in as much as it, it teaches children to say you know to to stand up to kind of maybe be in a stronger position against people that might kind of abuse them, of course. But I have some pretty. I have a few views on the on the whole wider edifice mm. of this whole sex education conversation, and I suppose it's twofold. One of them is there's just too much talk about sex, full stop, in general, to do with kids, foisting it on them. There's, there's a sense, this word safety, I think, is very telling. It's as if schools have become this kind of new sort of guardian of everything to do with, with you know, um, a child's life. And I just don't think that's, that's kind of healthy. And I think the idea, it's almost hubristic to assume that a school is the guarantor of safety. In the social sphere, you can never guard against every bad thing that can happen and in the sexual sphere and actually giving children the impression that if they just listen to the teacher, everything will be safe. And, and then how are they supposed to be prepared when actually they get out into the world and things don't follow what happens in the classroom? Second thing I agree with is the ideological component, I think, that Miriam Cates was talking about. Um, I think that, obviously, you know, condoms on bananas, I think that's quite, that's quite good and, and maybe we can widen that out. Uh, I do think some of what these external providers are teaching is clearly politicised. And I think, you know, this whole creep of ideology into the sort of common sense, basic domain of education, um, including with activist teachers and so on, which, which may not be such a big problem here as it is in the US, I think it's really problematic. I, I, I think that, you know, it doesn't mean if children aren't sort of fed this, you know, all this stuff, some of which is ideological, that they're going to therefore go out and be horrible to LGBT Q people, but it does mean that you know they they are getting they are getting fed a kind of um, a political line. I think under guise of being something else, and I think that's really troubling. Lloyd, my view is the reason on a cross-party basis we agreed relationship and sex education was that actually the education was too focused on condoms on bananas too much focused on the physical act of having sex. And, 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 well, I actually think that bit, people generally work out how to do anyway. I think generally people work out how to... Um, uh, be surprised to, to, how to, to do that. Know, what I think is, what, what we were really worried about and why we introduced relationship part to education was we were worried about how you have long-term relationships, how you manage challenging issues in relationships, how you make sure you develop stable relationships rather than relationships that are less stable. And actually that part was just as important as the physical part. So I do think we need to look at this on the round. And of course, if you're looking at all different kinds of stable relationships, you need to look at all the different ways relationships exist in the but modern era. Did you era. learn about how to have a stable relationship in school? Or did you learn because you're a nice person who learned in life? I mean, it's just bizarre well, to both, me school both. is the place yes, one learns. Both. I, 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 well, it, that's like saying, did you learn to count in school alone or did you learn it also at home with your parents? Well, no, also, well, actually, my parents early on started... Yeah. You, and you do with children, don't you? You start to... 
you learn from lots of different places, but should schools be teaching a basic level of how to have healthy relationships, how to manage mental health in relationships, those kinds of things. We have a mental health crisis in this country. We actually also have a rape crisis in this country. And I don't think we can say what we've been doing for the last 30 years has been enough. We need to do other things. But, do but we need that, to have better regulation? Be Possibly. Could that be reduced or diminished, Damien? Um, things like the increase in allegations of rape um, and acts of rape by teaching primary school children the emotional and social context around sex education and relationships. Well, I think everyone would agree that you know, sex education in schools is, is an important part uh, of the no, curriculum. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think and anyone I think, disagrees with that. And I think we need to be really clear about what people are being taught. I think parents should have a right to know what the, ch the children are being taught in yeah. the school. It could vary a lot. But equally, children's home life can vary a lot as well, which is why this can be important too. The, the, the biggest influence on what a child probably thinks a normal relationship is, is the relationship they see in the home where they live. You know? And, and some, for some children, that could be quite a difficult, quite a challenging relationship. And therefore, it's important they understand more about the, the rest of what, the world, what happens in the world. We also can't divorce the fact that you know we should have real concerns about online safety and actually what children are learning from what they see and interact with online particularly adult content particularly pornography as well and I think that's and that part of the debate which is not really part of this debate we've had today and, and the debate in Westminster Hall that Miriam's involved in but actually saying that children are being taught a lot from what they see online and that has become a bit of a wild west mm -hmm. and we need those higher safety standards the online safety bill will bring in. Mm -hmm. I think, look, Zoe, one thing you said earlier about there being sort of too much sex education in schools, and like, I'm not entirely sure I sort of agree with that. I think you do have to tackle this topic head on, and I think going back to Miriam Cater's comments before, I think she was in coded reference to the trans debate as well, which is obviously a very contentious one. It's one that I think Whitehall and the government is struggling with as well, when they're looking at um, reforms to um, sort of self-identification and those kind of issues as well. There's no easy way to do this, and I think, you know, you've got to have some kind of tolerance between both sides of the debate here. And I think with regards to sex education schools, when I think back sort of to when I was at school, a lot of it was the boys go in one classroom and the girls go in another classroom and you learn entirely different things. I think it has to be something that's done together so that both um, sexes can see both sides of this debate and have a wider understanding. So it's not just compartmentalizing people. So boys learn what boys do and girls learn what girls do. I think do. teaching a debate is perfectly fine. Yeah. But I think what these, what's been well publicized is that these outside contractors that come in to do the sex ed are not teaching a debate they are absolutely advancing something that is political whichever side of it you happen to be on and I think that's different from teaching children a basic value if that is the if school is the appropriate but the place only to do that, example of that tolerance Miriam, which I agree with of yeah. course they the need only to example that. Yeah. that Miriam could give was about consent so, yes so I, there I mean, are I'm other... interested to look at the examples and I'll be I'll come well, on to the Westminster Hall debate. The West but, debate but I am suspicious that this kind of general of there are lots of examples of outside actors when I learnt about it in school, the teacher used external resources, books, and they put on a video on the TV and we watched it. You know, it was a the debate is quite boring. different now, Lloyd, though. There's obviously <laughs> many more boring. issues no, than when you no, were no, school, no, of course, yeah. but what I'm saying is teachers have always used mm. outside resources. I don't think we expect teachers to create their own resources. And it's quite right that the Department for Education should list trusted sources that they say that teachers should more heavily draw from than other sources. And I think that's a reasonable balance to All have. Right. Well, let's move on to this. In The Times, new curbs for online gambling catastrophe as Premier League clubs escape sponsor ban. Uh, this is the about the government reviewing gambling laws, um, but this report is actually saying that ministers have dropped plans to ban gambling companies from sponsoring Premier League football clubs and having their logos on the team shirts. You can see here uh, several Premier League football teams are sponsored by gambling companies. Um, Damien, why are so many football clubs sponsored by gambling companies? Uh, because it's people trying to get around the ban on advertising in China on gambling. So they sponsor Premier League teams so their logos are displayed in the Far East when they play. Most of the companies you look at on Premier League shirts you will never have heard of because they're not, they're not, not ones that trade here. There are some examples that, who do and some British companies that are involved in gambling that do sponsor. I think this should be looked at. So how appropriate are some of these sponsors? Uh, it has become something that is now most, and it seems that most Premier League clubs have some sort of Far yes. East gambling syndicate sponsoring them and, I'd, and I would question whether that's appropriate. Well, should they be banned, uh, those gambling Well, I mean, it's part of the gambling review. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd wait to see what the review says rather than taking a report for it, a word for it. But we'll see, you know. But. I think not. I mean, I, I regard advertising as a form of free speech, actually. And I think that in as much as it's legal, um, gambling uh, and people pay for I mean uh, people pay for the advertising uh, I mean I just I don't see how it can how you can you know start just picking off things that can't be sort of advertised without serious incursions onto free speech and I feel that way about the junk food 
uh, ban as well. And I also think specifically with gambling, which you could say is different from smoking, um, it's very unlikely that someone is going to see a T-shirt and think, oh, I'm going to become a, a gambler and take up this addiction. Uh, so I think it's, it's harmless and it actually just allows us to think more widely about... Uh, and what, and what do you base that on? I mean, do, do you, is there evidence to say it is or it isn't an influence? Oh, it's advertising on gambling? There you're right, Joe. I have I cannot call um, lots of statistics to bear on that. No. It's um, but it's a it's I think it does operate differently from physical. So, for instance, glamorization is something that really was huge in cigarette advertising, tobacco advertising. Um, I don't think gambling has the same issue with appearing to be either cool or glamorous, and therefore I. I think, I think the association with Premier League football yeah. is an attempt to make it look cool and glamorous and to encourage younger people to bet with the, in, but with do the they invitation of free bets. Football stars with gambling, well, which I every, think is quite if, different if, images. If almost every Premier League club has got a gambling sponsor, mm -hmm. and there's a huge amount of TV sponsorship around in in play in game betting. I think if they see a bets, football right? star gambling, then it starts to be attractive. I think if they see the name of a gambling firm on a T-shirt. You know, they don't think football stars are kind of spending their time gambling it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, well, but they, earn, they earn quite a lot of yeah. money, I suppose, but in the first place. But, I mean, in terms, in terms of the issue of money, yeah. um, clubs need money, don't they? Yeah, the um, money they make from, from shirt sponsors is small compared to the money they make from TV rights. I mean, this is, their, their, their income doesn't turn on, the, on, the, on whether you have a, you know, a paint company or a gambling firm sponsoring your shirt. And, and particularly Premier League company. Uh, oh, but what about, lo well, what well, about lower well, league well, football? Well, we'd be if quite the band easily was able to um, replace that. Now... If any bank comes in, yeah. it needs to be brought in in a measured way so that people can replace uh, sponsorships if need be. But we have a problem with gambling now that is very... I mean, my granddad was a bookmaker and going and placing a bet mm. on the horses in Cheltenham where he was in, he was in Gloucestershire, you know, kind of is a very different process than going online where you can bet um, repeatedly huge amounts of money over and over again in a very addict... And we do know it's in a very addictive sure. process. Oh, yeah. And particularly the targeting of children where you start to have gambling or gambling quasi things in gaming that then does drag people... In. And we do know it's addictive. I actually do think that it means that we have a responsibility to say, whilst we sort out the wider regulation of gambling, which has, I think, gone awry in the last 10, 15 years, mm. we need to probably restrict what they can advertise in mm. certain areas and fields because at the moment we know is a yeah. bit of a wild west. Sure. Yeah. Online gambling is a particular issue and it's different, isn't it? It is. And I think obviously that's why there's this big package of reforms coming in because there's a huge amount of evidence that this is, uh, is addictive and yeah. it has been glamorised and actually, you know, can lead to very severe mental health issues. With this particular issue of the Premier League shirts, though, I think Damien actually seized on it, which is the point that you've never heard of these companies mm -hmm. before. They're not mainstream yeah. gambling, you know, sort of wh wherever you might go rules. to the bookmakers. And the fact this sort of loophole exists is bringing something into people's orbit that wouldn't otherwise be there. So it feels a very odd thing for the government to do here. And I guess it's wider pressure and I think a lot of it, as you said, Joe, reference is grassroots football as well as, well as the Premier League, that smaller clubs are desperate for money, particularly post-coronavirus, to make sure they can recoup their losses. And this is an easy source of revenue for them. So that's why this exists. But it just doesn't tally with the government's general strategy. No. Well, the government doesn't have a proper strategy at the moment because we're yeah. still waiting for the gam some of the gambling, uh, wider gambling strategy to be released. We're still waiting for... Well, actual well, 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 a proper well, gambling review yeah, and it's about to report. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and that includes things like, uh, and that it's report. about to report, and that includes things like uh, loot boxes in video games, which yeah. is a form of, effectively a form of gambling, recognises mm. gambling in other countries, but, but not here. So that's a, a very, long time. Well, it's very comprehensive, yeah. and it has to look at a lot of new forms of gambling, and uh, that te technology has enabled as well. So there is a very, you know, clear strategy, and, and gambling oh. reviews, you know, the governments always conduct the periodically. Is being worked on. We don't yet know what the outcome of it but is. But I think we know yeah. what they're going to do or what the proposals are. Um, are you saying, though, that Damien, that the government is to some extent ducking this? Uh, this issue, um, even if you don't think it is as, as big an issue as online gambling and some of the other forms uh, that are so addictive? Well, we don't actually know what the government's going to say in the review yet, or, or if, the, if the government's not going to include uh, shirts on Premier League. Well, it, I mean, well they're, they're reporting that they're not, but yeah. I mean, but, you're I mean, right, but, we don't know. But we don't know the reason for that, so I think let's wait and see. But I, I would say if we've got a lot of, basically, a lot of Far East gambling companies trying to advertise mm -hmm. in China and elsewhere where, advertising, where gambling is banned, and advertising is banned, using the Premier League as a vehicle, I would question whether that is 
appropriate or not, or something we should allow or not. But you wouldn't want to see the lower league clubs be included well, in this? Well, at the moment, the lower league clubs aren't actual um, targets to some of these people trying to get around the loopholes because they're not broadcast in the same way yeah. in the Far East. So it's a particular problem for the Premier League and the higher um, divisions, and so therefore it does actually need to be focused on the higher divisions uh, to start with. If, in a wider review, we want to restrict gambling, uh, advertising, I think there are um, good points and other points to be made on that. That's what we need the review for. But this particular problem is that our football clubs are being used um, and not actually, uh, uh, not actually for British consumption. All right. Anything finally from you, Zoe, on this? No, I just think um, I, I think this is it, it brings everyone, in, it brings kind of lawmakers and, and politicians and stuff into such minute areas of attempted control that I just I, I, I sort of want to ask, is there anything that's advertised that isn't potentially addictive? I know gambling is, is a quite a serious form of addiction. But, it, you know, I think that if this is an example of a sort of micromanaging of what, you know, citizens are allowed to see and what they what the effect of it might be. And I think it is quite nanny state. And I think I think it's censorious. And I think, as I say, I think advertising is a form of free speech and there should be a lot less kind of, you know, if it's legal, if, if gambling remains legal, um, yeah. Un unregulated gambling is not legal in this yeah. country. Gambling is regulated and it has yeah. been for many, sure. many years. These are companies that are not are always even regulated British mm. companies that are advertising well, it, yeah. on our And customers. if it was like Labrooks or William Hill doing it, well, a handful of British bookmakers mm. doing it, I wouldn't particularly have a problem yeah. with it. So, I think, right. just, so I think there is, is a very different, I think. Yeah. 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 All right, everybody, let's take a look at this from the 2019 general election night. I'll walk you along the Red Wall. This is through northwest England. 75 seats here, almost all of them Labour. Into Yorkshire, this is Wakefield, another Labour marginal in Labour hands since 1932. Again, they voted to leave the EU, as did Great Grimsby. That's been Labour since 1945. How much will this wall crumble tonight? Well, you hear Sophie Rayworth there talking about the red wall, the crumbling red wall, as she said, uh, when Boris Johnson won that 80-seat majority. Uh, you've written a whole book about the red wall, um, Sebastian. What is it? Um, thank you very much for mentioning the book, Joe, of course. A uh, new paperback You're welcome. out. Yes. Um, so the Red Wall are essentially a set of contiguous seats. That means they've all got a similar profile that were traditional Labour heartland. They would tend to be places that had heavy industry, uh, many working class communities, and had consistently voted Labour. And bit by bit, they'd fallen away from the party. And I said four definitions for what are Red Wall seats. They are not all the seats the Tories won for the first time in 2019. It's Number one, they had a very heavy Brexit vote, i.e. well above the 52% national average. Two, um, they had big Labour majorities, five figures um, throughout the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, three, they'd never had a Conservative MP since the war, many of them never. Mm -hmm. And four, they'd always had a small but consistent Conservative Party vote. And when you came to the 2019 election, where Labour's position on Brexit was very unpopular in these places, combined with the unpopularity of the then leader Jeremy Corbyn, that meant that these places flipped Conservative for the first time and they went over and it didn't hand Boris Johnson its majority, but he handed him a much bigger majority. Were it not for the Red Wall, he would have had a kind of 10 or 20 seat majority in 2019. And that's obviously changed the Conservative Party considerably. It's changed how he can govern, mm. but it's also raised big questions about where the Tory party goes next. What about the Blue Wall? So, in the new edition of the book, third time, um, there is, uh, we've, I've been into Isha and Walton in Surrey, which is where Dominic Raab, the Deputy Prime Minister, the MP, and that is a blue wall seat. Now, the blue wall, in some ways, is the second part of the post-Brexit realignment, and the metrics for those are places that had a heavy Remain vote, uh, a Conservative MP since 2010, in many cases longer, places where Labour or the Lib Dems over-indexed their national average in 2017 and 2019. Those places, essentially, they're nearly all suburban. Uh, they've got a high proportion of skilled, professional, private sector, managerial class, so solicitors, doctors, accountants, that sort of thing, sorry, doctors in the private sector. And those are places where the way the Tory party has gone under Boris Johnson they're not really liking where it's going in terms of policy, in terms of culture, and in terms of style. Now, oh. one we've seen the Cheshire and Amersham by-election last mm -hmm. year, that was Blue War, and I've explored these various places, and my sense is there's a good 20 or so seats the Lib Dems have got a real chance of winning come the next election, right. if it's still Boris Johnson leading the Tory party. Are these terms meaningful to people? 
I think it depends. I mean, I, I think Seb has given a very good explanation of, of the, how, the, how those terms sit. There's a slight danger it's used for any marginal seat, is either in a red, blue wall or a red wall, and that's not what it means at all. I think that is my bet noir, Dave. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, really, I think that you're looking at, I think, the influence of two, of two things. One is, you know, Brexit versus Remain. Is that, is that going to be a, a fault line in the way we vote for the future? I'm not sure it will, actually, and I, and I think, actually, the last general election didn't demonstrate that was necessarily going to be a fault line. We are seeing, though, I you think... You don't it, think it did? Well, no, I'm not, not, not completely. I think it's too simplistic to say that. What we're seeing is a degree of social... If you take the red wall seats in the north, a sort of degree of social changes happening in those constituencies that are things affected the way they voted. Is that a permanent shift? We don't yet know. I think with the blue wall, the it's become a bit of a catch-all phrase for any seat the Tory party might lose at a by-election. is somehow part of the blue wall. I, th I think Seb's right. You know, the question is, is there a value shift amongst the voters which is sending some voters more to Labour, some, some people away from the Conservative Party? And I think that's really what this debate is about. Is this, is this, is this a permanent change? in politics or is it just a temporary thing? Uh, Lloyd, do you think these terms are helpful? I mean, they're helpful in the sense of aiding discussion to talk uh, between politicians and pundits. Are they helpful when you're on the doorstep? Mm. No, not really, because on the doorstep, what matters are the bread and butter issues. And I think if any politician goes to any of these red wall, blue wall, whatever wall seats um, around the country and starts to talk to them as if they've read a manual about what the red wall or blue wall is, they're probably in for a hiding, you know, kind of uh, be quickly chased out of that constituency. So, yes. In, for political punditry, you need to class things together to try and look at trends. Understand them. But, but yeah. I, I actually think how you win seats back either way, you know, or keep them either way, mm. is actually you understand the local issues. You have local candidates, you have active local parties, sure. you do that pavement politics. The Liberals, Liberal Democrats, uh, are, are traditionally very good at that in by-elections, doing that pavement politics. The other two main uh, parties are better doing it when it comes to big general elections. That's always been the case. Let's see how it moves forward. I mean, is it difficult, though, when you are a political party and you are on the doorstep in the way Lloyd has just described, and you want to possibly policies that are going to appeal to a broad section of the community um, and these areas these red wall blue wall seats may not be one homogenous group but does it help in terms of translating into the offer that parties make to voters I mean I think you have to impose some categories on on, on everything and politics you know to simplify and to kind of um, you know impose order on what it is you're offering and what it is you're trying to kind of get voters um, to vote for and what voters themselves might want. Um, I think, you know, Seb had made this point really well in his, in his book, I think, but also in, in that long piece. Um, you know, the enormity of Boris's brief, essentially, the, the Tory party has tried to kind of, you know, they, they've, it, it's such a huge constituency after that, the, the sort of last general election. Um, it's actually impossible for them to uh, really have a coherent... Uh, mm. politics. So, so red and blue all kind of have to merge together because they're trying to please literally everyone. I think the other thing that's been notably confusing about politics recently and perhaps has helped collapse the distinctions um, that used to be there is that sort of economic questions have become so confusing and yet ubiquitous. And so we've been in these sort of crisis politics for ages. We've had Brexit, then we had COVID, and now we find ourselves in the cost of living. And we've got a prime minister who's you know, for some, he seems quite sort of almost as sort of social. Or he's not actually obviously socialist, but some feel that he's he's not recognisable in terms of what his views are on the economy yeah. and free market. So people are confused about that. And actually, now we really need to engage with the economy. And and people are kind of well, what well, are the different parties offering? I mean, us it's, on that? it's certainly true. We've had plenty of your colleagues sitting here saying we don't recognise uh, some of what the government is doing. It still seems to be pursuing uh, a bigger state, even though it says we're going to wean voters off. We want to see taxes cut right. Right now, um, the identity of the Conservative Party is blurred. Well, firstly, the idea of the Conservative Party appealing to the whole nation is not a new one. It used to be called One Nation Conservatism, and, and the idea of there being a broad, broad appeal base is right. We've gone through, we have a financial crisis followed by a pandemic and now a war, which costs quite a, quite a lot of money. So, yes, I, mean, I want to see tax cuts. Most Conservatives do. Most Conservatives say the state should you know, no, be no bigger than is absolutely necessary. But what we can't do is become a party that says, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not actually going to make the state smaller, we're just going to stop paying for it, you know, and we're going to cut taxes that we can't afford. So there has to be a coherent plan, and voters you know, expect the government to have a coherent plan. They probably want to see tax cuts because of high inflation, but they want to know that that can be delivered and is affordable. Right. In terms of the realignment for politics for Labour, I mean, obviously, that was a very difficult result in 2019. I mean, is it, in your mind, still the priority, uh, or maybe it never was, to win back those seats that were uh, synonymous with the Labour Party? 
Well, uh, some of those red wall seats, actually, the local election results look positive for us. What is more difficult is the seats that had swung to us from 97 in the Midlands. So I, I'm more comfortable with the idea in a lot of those red walls, the economic message, the message that actually the Conservatives are taxing, but they're not actually spending very well for a lot of those red wall areas, um, is cutting through. But I do think that Labour still has a challenge. How do we deal with the Midlands? How do we win some new seats in the South, which are now coming open to us because of demographic changes? And let's be honest, that's, what, that's why they're coming up to the demographic changes and how do you deal with Scotland well, and all of those things are difficult questions my view is you've got to understand place and the one place that the Labour Party has been successful since 97 almost consistently is Wales where we've been in government non-stop it's the only place we've been in government non-stop and that's because no one doubts that the Welsh Labour Party is deeply patriotically Welsh pro-Welsh language, pro-Welsh um, uh, parliament, but equally pro-being part of a bigger union. And that's, yeah. I thought you were going to say London. And, and, yeah. yeah. and that's where I, I think, mean, that, I think we they, need to learn can, in other areas I think of the, the difficulty country. Labour is, can you reconcile the London Labour Party with the Labour Party, in, 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 with Labour, former Labour voters in the Red Wall? I think, and that is something Keir Starmer has yet to demonstrate he can do. I mean. The point but, that I think you'll be very careful with the Red Wall is, it's not some sort of very different part of the country. Hmm. And when I spent this time going round the these places. What you've seen is over the past four, four decades of deindustrialization, they've become economically more like the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, parts of County Durham or the East Midlands look just like Kent or Essex, yeah. uh, particularly in the fact that they've got smaller employers, their communities are more individualistic, people aren't sort of working together, living together in trade unions together. They live much more Thatcherite lives. And I think in some sense, the government has done a bit of a misreading of the Red War and by trying to appeal them with what well, I think you sort of call it semi socialist policies. Whereas, in fact, in many respects, I think they voted for Conservatives because they're Conservatives. What Labour has to do, I think Lloyd is right here, is to get focused on the politics of place because ever since I think pretty much the mid noughties, it's moved away from that and seemed to not be comfortable with the country it wants to run. And if you don't visibly look like you want to govern these places, why do you expect them to vote for you? All right. Well, if you were watching uh, Politics Live yesterday, which I'm sure you were, uh, you will have seen during PMQ's Prime Minister's questions with Dominic Raab and Angela Rayner, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister say this. She talks about working people. She talks about working people. Where was the right honourable lady when the comrades were on the picket line last Thursday? Where was she when the Labour front bench were joining them rather than standing up for the public? She was at the Glyndebourne Music Festival, sipping champagne, <laughs> listening to opera. Champagne socialism is back in the Labour Party. What was he getting at exactly there, Damien, in a fairly light-hearted way? I don't know. I, don't, I think he shouldn't have... He was unwise to have said it. Quite right, Angela Rainey should go to Glyndebourne if she wants to. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Uh, what do you think he was getting at? Well, I think, uh, mixed with that little wink, misogynistic wink uh, at the beginning there, I think he was getting at trying to um, run her down as someone that enjoys herself, someone that enjoys culture and arts, and I think that that's what he was trying to do there. And clearly it was planned. One of the speechwriters will have fed him that line. He wouldn't have just come up with it. So it was a poorly planned line from, I think, someone that has very little uh, direction or, or ability of leadership. And uh, probably reading a bit too much into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, 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 do, you, do you think he came up with it from the top of his head? Or I, do you I don't think really think it matters. I, I don't well, think you should use it. I don't no, think no, it matters. Think well, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let, 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 the problem of champagne socialism is both funny and real. Um, and I think because... It's not it a problem. That, it, I want champagne for everyone. Okay, I want... No, right. <laughs> Luxury automated <laughs> communism. No, no, but right. I do want people... I'm sorry we haven't this, got any here. I want no. people in this country well, hang on, to aspire to enjoy different things. Some people will like opera, others will like car racing. The point is there is a genuine potential for hypocrisy there. Which is part of the left's What's position, the which is, but it's, but it's, um, but it's that they enjoy themselves. Well, it, it, I mean, if you look at the economic processes and the market processes that lead to the arrival of that champagne and the elitism of Glyndebourne, which, by the way, I'm very pro. But I think, I think this was a kind of jokey thing, and that's right because I think actually these are really, it's quite a complicated issue as to why it, why champagne socialism is, you know. Hypocritical. I mean, I mean, how the market functions in a way that is counter to what 
the Labour Party, you might argue. And, and so people should take the time to pick apart the hypocrisy because it's really interesting. I, I, so that was obviously... An, a, a, you know, so you I don't that think take on the hypocrisy. I, I don't think there's too much hypocrisy. I mean... At, oh, but there's a bit. But, but, well, <laughs> uh, actually, interestingly, Glyndebourne aside, most opera in this country is subsidised by the state. Most, uh, most of the um, high arts in this country them, is supported by opera. the state. So why should, therefore, actually, people, taxpayers mm -hmm. of all walks of life, enjoy it? And why is, it, hypo why is it hypocrisy? If the state has supported that, for everyone to join. I, I say Glyndebourne yeah. apart because Glyndebourne is one of our few opera houses that doesn't get huge state grants. And that's great too, that you can have private endeavours. Mm. The Labour Party is not against private endeavours. Oh, the Communist the Labour Party, Party loved the culture Labour for Party, the masses. That's the Labour the Party issue. is for a mixed economy. And Glyndebourne is a great example of our arts, which have provided more income revenue oh. to this country <laughs> than right. many of our, <laughs> many of our <laughs> hard <laughs> industries. <laughs> All I was going to say is I thought Dominic Raab's PMQ's turn was actually very good good yesterday, aside from that quip, and I just don't think it was a wise thing, it had a bit of a whiff of old-style conservative classism mm -hmm. to it as well. well. And I just think, really, mm -hmm. the fact is, you know, if he was saying, why wasn't she on the picket line, she was at the opera, there's many other examples he could have used. And I think Angela Wren did a very witty response to this as well, and I think there's pictures of her there. And of course you should be able to go and enjoy it, as do many MPs across the spectrum. And I think there's a long history of Labour MPs from all parts of the party enjoying opera. Well, well let's just show you the tweet from Angela uh, Rayner, deputy leader of the Labour Party. Dominic Raab won't approve, but I did indeed go to the opera last week. It cost me £62. Tom Eisner, a working class lad from Buxton, near where I grew up, kindly invited me. He's been playing violin at Glyndebourne for 36 years. Never let anyone tell you you're not good enough. Is well, I, class I, still a potent I, force? I, in, sorry, I'll come to you. No, still a potent force in politics? Well, not, in, not in that way. I, I agree with Tab. I, don't, I think it's like, it feel, does feel a little bit old fashioned. If the Labour Party's mm. policy was to abolish Glyndebourne and she'd gone to it, that would be a different, different <laughs> matter. <laughs> 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 or abolish Champagne. <laughs> yeah, be, you know, there are plenty of things you can criticise the Labour Party for, and, and indeed, and indeed, the inappropriateness of the of the strikes and the, and the misery they caused last week. And I was just grateful that some uh, members of the, the some rail staff didn't strike last week, and some of the services to Kent still ran. I'm grateful for them for coming on coming into work uh, as other people were as well. I mean, do you think, Zoe, that political culture is more important these days than political class? Yes, I think that we, like the class analysis. Seem, I mean, I, I I don't think that's sort of at the heart of it anymore. And I think. So, you know these super sort of st matters of style um, discourse. Uh, these things, I think, definitely have become very important. So, so um, you know, image obviously is part of that. I mean, look, in this case, uh, class is complicated. Basically, we need to revisit class because, as you say, going to the opera does not in any way. Be, is not something that should be tradition. You know, it, in fact, it has a you know working class tradition and everything. And of course, um, well, on that point, you should make that Dominic Raab is the son himself of um, Polish immigrants, mm. I believe, as well, and does not fit a kind of stereotypical aristocratic cons um, conservative deputy prime minister in the view he was putting forward there. But I just think that quip just was sort of it was it was a, a reminder. Bit cheap. Of, it was it was just yeah. a cheap way of doing something. Right, I think it was shame. beneath yeah. it. Yeah, because exactly. it's actually really it interesting. Um, stereotypical topic. politics, and you're quite right, class has dramatically changed. You know, kind of people who have degrees but work in call centres for minimum wage are just as much working class as people who might have gone down mines. Well, but I was going to say... It's I was interesting gonna, about oh. the positive people who do describe yeah. themselves as working mm -hmm. class. Uh, I mean, apparently, I can't remember exactly when the poll was actually done. I think 2016. And, and it was something like 60% of mm -hmm. people, maybe, because of the distinction you made then just there. Well, well for, for, I mean... Decent class analysis would say anyone that is working for a wage where they don't have the direction of their labour, so i.e. have a boss that tells them what to do, when to do it, is working class. That is the vast majority of people in this country. Now, we, we can debate whether that economic class and social class are the same things. Yeah. What I was just going to say Briefly. is Angie says, don't let anyone tell you you're not good enough. I did used to sing at Glyndebourne and they did tell me I wasn't good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you to do a rendition just now. Uh, thank you to all of my my guests uh, for today. Just before we go, a reminder that our schedule next week is still affected by Wimbledon tennis. You can see there on the screens in front of you. I'll be back tomorrow and on Monday. Bye-bye.